Good morning, good morning. Oh, I've got a handbrake off. Yes, I have. Got the windscreen wipers on. Yes, I have. I'm going the scenic way today. I'm going to do a pepper pig and splash through some muddy puddles. How are you? I bought a repurposed oil tank. There's a lot of uh, oil tanks around that are single funded. They've got a single skin. And nowadays, if you want to store oil, it has to be in a double skin tank. So these single skin tanks are no use for oil anymore, but they do make good uh, rainwater tanks, especially when they were never used for oil, which is the one I've got was uh, someone bought it and then realized it was no use. And so uh, they sold it to me. So that's it. Just make sure I'm driving safely. So uh, anyway, I was worried that I wasn't going to fill this tank up because I installed it at the beginning of the last summer, and it was uh, had absolutely no water in it at all. And you start doing stupid things like thinking about filling it up from the hose, which is which is a bit stupid. <laughs> anyway, I could have filled it up 50 times over this winter. There's been so much rain. I could have had a 500,000 litre water tank and, and filled it up. So, here we go, into Preston. How are you? Are you well? I've just jumped out of the shower, look. I'm getting a bit slower about going in in the mornings. It's really bad. Here's a trick, especially if you've been nicked for speeding, which I haven't, by the way. If you're driving through a 30 mile an hour zone, put yourself in third gear. If you've got a manual, well, you can always put yourself in third gear, even if you're in an automatic. And you find it very difficult to go over 30 miles an hour in third gear, in most cars. So, uh, and you feel so you're going fast. It's the old engine's revving away. I've cleaned the windscreen, so you should have a nice clear view through the windscreen now. That was, that was a bit, that was a clean L wipe did that. Clean L wipes, very good for cleaning glass, I've got to say. I suppose they're pretty good for cleaning everything, but if you want to clean the glass in your car, you know, especially on the inside, get the old clean L wipe on it. What else? Oh yeah, I put a new question in my survey. Now, we're recruiting for a new receptionist. And we interviewed them all yesterday. What you do basically, it's about, it's about a, I'd say it's about, it takes about a month, start to finish. What you do is you, you put an advert together, you put it in the newspaper, it comes out the next week in the newspaper, you give them till the end of the week after to uh, apply. So for example, if it goes in on say Wednesday the 1st, then the closing day is 5 p.m. on Friday the 9th. And then you interview on the week beginning the uh, 12th. And then uh, if they only have to give a week's notice, then they should start on the 19th or the 20th. So, so perhaps about three weeks start to finish. And uh, obviously I've interviewed for loads of staff, you know, and, it's pretty much, pretty much second nature now. All you have to do, really, you um, get a lot of CVs in, and you can weed out the uh, people who are obviously, uh, you know, probably not uh, going to, uh, not going to uh, be suitable. And then uh, you, or well, basically, what you do is you choose the top three. When I say weed out those that aren't going to be suitable, I mean basically you just you choose the top three, and then obviously you then email everybody. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you email everybody who's not got into the top three. Now, why do you choose the top three? It's because uh, it is possible that you someone might come in and they might not want the job. They might not like the job. They might not like you. They might not like the working environment. They might have just done it speculatively to see, you know, or to get their hand in for an interviews or, or whatever, whatever. 
So that came as a bit of a shock to me the first time I uh, offered someone the job. Um, <laughs> and then I said, I'm pleased to say, uh, you've been, uh, we'd like to offer you the job. And they said, well, I thought about it, but I've decided it's not right for me, you know. So thank you, but no thanks. And that was, that was a big problem at the time, because what I'd done is, I'd written to everybody and phoned up everybody and said, sorry, on this occasion, you've not been successful. And then uh, the only person I had left to ring was the one person who we picked for the job, and then they said no. So then I had to then go cap in hand to the person who we was our second choice and saying, look, uh, we've been let down really badly and, and uh, we would, you know, would you consider um, taking the job sort of begging? Um, and I don't know, I think they actually said no. Uh, you know, on the case of, you know, like if you don't, if I'm not right for you, then you're not right for me sort of thing. Couldn't blame them, but that caused a lot of trouble. So that's number one tip about recruiting. When you're going to offer someone a job, offer them the job before you tell all the others that you're not going to offer them the job, right? Anyway, so so you get it. So so out of the three, you're not likely to get all three rejecting the job. So uh, by by rejecting the ones that are fourth, fifth, and so on, then um, yeah, you're not really uh, putting yourself in jeopardy too much. Okay. So then. The next stage is, the next tip I've got to give you is uh, you're not going to get a, an absolutely massive stream of high quality candidates. And let me put it this way, I mean we were, we were recruited for a part time receptionist. I mean basically it's something that pretty much anyone can do. You know, we're not insisting on GCSEs for this job, we're insisting on uh, you know, a bit of a personality, a bit of a work ethic um, and uh, some IT <laughs> some, and not to be petrified of IT um, so <clears throat> and I'm in Thanet and Thanet is a depressed area uh, now it may be that I've gone off a bit too quickly because I think if I'd waited till the furlough scheme runs out then probably would have had a wider field of applicants but I kid you not right? we put an advert in the local newspaper uh, may not be the newspaper that everybody reads but we, we at least we advertise in the local newspaper and we carried that over onto Facebook and of the, the three candidates we interviewed two had found out about it on Facebook they were the worst two and the one one had their mother had taken a photograph of the advert in the paper and, uh, see, and that tells you a lot as well because when it comes to interviews, okay, okay, there's only me and Lou interviewing, and uh, I'll, let, I'll I'll tell you uh, the, the various areas that you need to interview in. Basically, we allow half an hour for an interview, and that includes a tour, and mostly the interview is over in 15 minutes, and that's because um, we want to keep it fairly tight, fairly snappy, fairly sort of no, okay, that's fine, that's a good answer. Let's move on to the next question, sort of thing. Um, the first question we ask is, um, uh, how did you find out about the vacancy? How did you hear about us? It's the same question we ask the patients. Um, and that's useful because in future you want to know how to make the best use of your advertising budget, or staff advertising budget. And if everyone says, oh, I just Googled you and found it on your website, then you know that's where you need to put it in future. Uh, in this case, it was two on Facebook and one on uh, one uh, sort of uh, in the, from the newspaper, sort of by by uh, indirect means through her mother. Uh, secondly, you know, just just very general question. Tell me a bit about yourself. What are you doing now? What made you apply for the job? You know, what is it about the job that attracted your eye, etc., and made you come along? Blah blah blah. And then that is just a, that is a very general question. You will get quite a useful, lot of useful information about that. Now, you of course you will have their CV, so you can, and this, and you'll have shortlisted them on the basis of their CV. But now, what you're doing is you're talking to them person to person, and you're asking yourself, is this the sort of person that I want to have working in my surgery? Now, don't forget old uh, Angry's first rule of employing staff, which is that it's easier to make a cheerful person competent than it is to make a competent person cheerful. 
So basically, you want to pick a, a cheerful person, okay? Even if they've got deficiencies in their skills, because you can very quickly make those deficiencies up. You can't really make up a character deficiency or a personality deficiency. They tend to be stuck and you tend to get stuck with them. So, also on their CVs, they'll have uh, sort of gaps. Um, and I know when when you're uh, drawing up a CV, right, okay, 10 second silence, remember? Junction of death, junction of death. All right, right, tractor left, out we go. Ooh. So um, you, on a CV, when, when you put together a CV, they say to you, look, don't leave any gaps. Don't leave even a week's gap. Because if you leave a week's gap, then, you know, whoever's reading the CV will assume that you uh, uh, were arrested and spent a week in uh, juvenile detention for that week and you've left it off. So, but, but, but you will always get gaps on the CVs. And let's say most frequently, like we had the one, one we had someone with a gap on their CV, say from November, last November to now, which is March. So their CV finished in November. So obviously I'm interested on why, you know, what, what, what is this person doing now? Now the chances are they're unemployed, which is fine. That's not a problem. I mean, they, uh, uh, plenty of people have uh, been, were furloughed and then have been made redundant, you know, because their jobs don't exist anymore. You can't really, um, no, he's coming up very fast behind me, Mr. BMW, fortunately he's got some decent brakes. Uh, yeah, so you can't, uh, at the moment, I mean, you can't, there's a lot of good people uh, who used to work in uh, uh, service industries like hairdressing and uh, catering, you know, uh, entertainment and stuff like that, who are, who are, who are unemployed. So. But this sort of, you know, so what's up type question, the opening question, is quite a sort of a neutral thing and it gives them a chance to launch into, you know, when you go to an interview, you, you think, oh, I'm going to try and get certain things across, try and say, I'll try and say this, try and say that. So what you're doing is you'll give them a chance to, just to say that, you know. And um, now, as dentists, we uh, quite routinely get a patient who is, uh, who is uh, nervous, frightened, in pain, uh, and uh, you have to get them to the point where possibly within 10 minutes you have to stick a big needle in them. So uh, we, are, we are pretty good masters at reading people. And the ability to read people quickly I think is a skill that uh, that we, we have if you're a, anything like a good dentist and so what you can do is you can very quickly read these people the uh, the applicants and sort of try and get an idea for who they are you know you get an idea of what sort of background they come from how they talk will tell you a lot about them even uh, you know the size of their eyebrows tells you something uh, <laughs> so that's what you're doing is you're just in that first five minutes you're just picking up the non the, the non-verbal cues as well then what you want to do is say well look you know what is your ideal job you know I want to see if we can what we're offering fits you you know does is it what you you want and some of them will say no I've got uh, child care requirements which mean I need it's very important that I have fixed hours or I'm on universal credit, so it's very important that I work fewer than 16 hours. Or um, I am currently picking uh, for ASDA, uh, which means I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning every morning. I, have to, I, I work overnight and I'm really, really getting fed up with we, we working nights every night, you know. So... Um, <clears throat> So then, so that sort of leads you into sort of a dialogue about whether you can meet in the middle regarding uh, what you need, and and if you can't, then I think the best thing to do is just be honest and say, look, you know, I know you, you said that uh, the most you can work is 16 hours, but you don't mind if it's less, you know, it, you know, it could be like 12 hours or 10 hours, you don't mind, but unfortunately for us at the moment, 
a receptionist who only works 10 hours and, and couldn't possibly go over 16. It's not really what this business needs. And so that's fair enough. But assuming that... Now, you don't terminate the interview at that point because you just say, well, you know, perhaps we, perhaps we'll, we might be able to get around there. Let's just put that on the back burner for the time being. Then what I do is I'm quite upfront about talking about pay. And I say to them, I don't say to them, uh, we're going to pay you £11 an hour. Would that be acceptable? Yeah. I, I quite, uh, and I have, I have had a few smart asses in the past where I've said to them, look, let's talk about pay. You know, roughly what, what do you expect to get paid? What are you getting paid at the moment? You know, I lump it in all together. And, uh, and the reason why I'm not frightened about saying that is because where I am, pretty much everybody's on minimum wage, which is eight pounds something an hour. And we're gonna be paying them 10 pounds something an hour. So for most uh, people we take on, it's like 20% pay increase. And not only that, I mean, better hours, you know, they working 8.30 to one is better than working 3 a.m. to uh, 10 a.m., which is what uh, one of them was. So, so, so you have a chat about pay. Now, I don't tell them what I'm going to pay them. And then and very few of them do actually say, well, actually, what are you going to pay me uh, at that point? I just say, look, I'm sure we can do better than what you're getting. And then <coughs> you can decide afterwards. When you make the job offer, you can say, I'm offering you a job to start when your notice completes. Um, at, uh, to work uh, 8.30 till 1, four days a week at £10.50 an hour and I'll um, uh, subject to a three month probationary period and then uh, but I'll, I'll send you a contract in due course you know uh, but what you need to do is you need to send them that email because they then need to have the confidence that they've got the job offer in order to be able to give in their notice it's not fair for them to say uh, yeah yeah I'll probably offer you the job why don't you give in your notice that's not fair at all. You, you have to make a formal offer. And I generally make it when on the day we were interviewing, like yes, we interviewed yesterday, and so I'd, I'd notified them all by pretty well within half an hour of the interview's ending, which was about 5.45. Um, now, uh, so we've done, uh, we've done uh, hours and we've done pay. And then the only other thing I do is I talk about um, transport because it is important that your staff turn up for work <laughs> uh, and that they, they're reliably and also um, uh, on time. So, uh, now, you could put in your advert that your know, own transport must be available, etc. But I don't, to be honest with you, I, I don't want to discriminate against someone who might be able to walk to work or might live right next to a bus stop which is two stops up from the surgery stop and who would have absolutely no trouble at all getting here but didn't have their own transport so what I do is I just talk about their plan to get to work on time uh, on the days when they're employed now uh, in in the sort of uh, pool that I'm recruiting in quite I would say quite a few people probably don't have their own car some of them do but uh, two out of the three we, we interviewed uh, got there by, one got there by taxi, one got there by bus. And uh, so, so you can say to them, like, you know, where, whereabouts are you, where do you live? Oh, I'm in local town, blah, blah, blah. Um, and um, and uh, so, yeah, so how did you get here? Did you get the bus? Yes, I did, yeah. Okay, and uh, uh, do you know if there is a bus that could get you to work for 8.30 in the morning, and do you know what bus that you would get? Uh, no, I haven't looked into that, you know, I haven't, I haven't researched that. Well, obviously that's not a good sign, is it, that someone's not, not given any thought at all about how they might get to work. Um, they've just managed to get to the interview, and as far as they're concerned, that's all they need to worry about. As long as you restrict your questions to their suitability for the job, now, what happens is they, they might, in the course of that the transport question, they might volunteer a ton of stuff. They might volunteer that they've got children. They might volunteer that they uh, 
uh, don't have a car and would be relying on a bus or whatever. Um, and that's there's nothing wrong with that. Again, getting, getting that information as long as you restrict your questions to the how that fact affects their suitability for the job. And lastly, the other question is robustness of health. I say to them, are you reasonably fit and healthy? Yeah. Now, that's not uh, because I want to discriminate against anybody who's not reasonably fit and healthy. It's because we are a small business. There are only two of us working there. There, there would only be three working after we get this person on. As a micro business, we are very, very severely affected. In the same way as if uh, the whole of <laughs> the whole of McDonald's on any day had one third of its workforce didn't turn up, they would be severely impacted. The reason why they can afford to take on people who aren't necessarily in robust health is because <clears throat> it really is peripheral to their field of operations. Whereas well, with us, it's very, very fundamental and. We are allowed in law to insist on robust health, uh, even to the extent that if someone starts taking a lot of time off sick, uh, getting uh, you know getting in touch with a person's doctor, asking them to provide sick notes to justify their sickness, and even terminating their contract on the grounds that they are not of robust health, uh, which was the requirement of the job. So. Um, <clears throat> So there's that, and then lastly, possibly, uh, you know, just talk about general standards in terms of dress. Uh, we had one applicant who had pink hair and was absolutely covered in tattoos, and uh, you know, she said in the summer, is it, you know, would it be a problem what I wore in the summer? And I said, well, only you know, if you come in, if you sit on reception in your bra and knickers, it might be a problem. Uh, and she said, oh, I know, um, only I've got, got quite a lot of tattoos. And I said, yes, I know. And she said, how do you know? And I said, and I, and I pointed down to her feet, and the tops of her feet, in her open, open shoes, were completely covered with spiders and webs and all sorts of stuff. So I'm like, you know, it's not, it's not at all, it's not that difficult. <laughs> if someone's completely covered in tattoos to know that, but that's not, you know, I mean, your receptionist is the face of your brand, isn't she? She is representative of your your brand. And so I think you are entitled to make choices about how you want your brand to come across. Um, and that might include uh, appearance. Um, certainly uh, would include dress, you know. Uh, they would have to be reasonably, smartly dressed. Um, but with, and you're quite within your rights to insist on a uniform, uh, which we did with one with one uh, receptionist. Um, but uh, you know it's much better if they use their own clothes, because then it's uh, they can they feel happier in their own clothes, and uh, it doesn't mean you can't give them a, a clothes allowance, uh, which again they would also appreciate, rather than sitting there in some itchy nylon, uh, ill-fitting nylon bag, which is what most uniforms are. Some, some sort of uh, uh, suit and skirt combo. So anyway, so as um, soon as the what's it's closed, we, I sent them all an email saying, uh, you know, uh, the one saying congratulations and everything, and then two saying uh, sorry. Now I always, there, there's a certain format for these things. I always say, uh, I'm sorry that on this occasion you were not successful. But I feel certain that with a CV as good as yours, uh, you will. It won't be too long before you find a job. You know, before you find employment. And I always think that I love the wording of that. I've always, I've used that for 30 years. I've used that wording. I think it's, um, you know, because it's a rejection, isn't it? And it, you know, it probably won't be the first or the last rejection they have. And uh, some of the people you reject are, are pretty unemployable. The second one, yesterday, for example, were absolutely stank of cigarettes. So, you know, I don't, you don't have to say to them, oh, you're a heavy smoker. And they'll say, oh yeah, how do you know that? And I'll say, because you, you smell terrible. You smell of cigarettes. Um, difficult to say that to someone. Uh, the, the, the other one who'd absolutely no clue about um, organizing the bus and 
I tried to explain the, the system in just in the very basic terms about we have like a standard software that makes the appointments and that sends out the emails and, and text automatically but you have to link it in with our invoicing system so that when um, we make an appointment we send out an invoice which is payable two days before the appointment is due and I'm not kidding I had to explain that three times and I'm like well if I got to explain that three times um, I'm not really going to be able to explain a pivot table am I on Excel so you know so and these are the sort of and that's but that's the subjective part of interviewing isn't it you you have to make you you've got the Roman Emperor's power to give them the thumbs up of uh, doom or the thumbs down of success So anyway, I hope those pointers on interviewing have uh, been useful. They're certainly uh, useful for me, and they're the results of, let's say, 30, 40 years of interviewing people, and doing it efficiently and doing it quickly, and getting the right person in the job. And we would have considered not appointing anybody if, if uh, all three of those people have been useless. And as I say, even though we're in an area of high um, economic deprivation, and it's a nice job, it's a clean job. Um, they're, they're still, um, we only had three applicants. It may be because we did it so fast uh, that, you know, and perhaps, or perhaps if we put it in a different paper, uh, we might have got more applicants. But fortunately, although two of them were, were pretty dodgy, one of them was, uh, was pretty good, so we're okay. Anyway, I'll let you know how it goes. Nice to talk to you, talk to you soon, bye.